For the past few weeks, we have been uh, looking at the the story of the lives of um, these four Hebrew young men. Uh, We said that uh, the idea of of Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Mishael, and Azariah being really young boys is is, uh, not really what the Bible portrays them at, but as they were young men going into captivity. Um, And so last week we we looked at how three of those four men uh, braved the, the fiery furnace and refused to bow to the, the statue that Nebuchadnezzar had uh, constructed, had set up. And that's really the end of, of their story. Uh, we won't be hearing more from those three. Uh, the rest of the book of Daniel really focuses on uh, the events, the, the dreams and visions um, in Daniel's life, and then a, a few more dreams by some of the, the kings here um, and actually, this morning we're we're going to to close the page on Nebuchadnezzar's life, and uh, next week we'll be looking uh, at a, another king uh, who Daniel serves under. And as we close the page this morning, uh, this kind of happens in an unexpected way, uh, and we'll dive into that. Uh, but for our kids this morning, our our word is going to be humble. And I did my best to show uh, maybe like a scene from E.B. White's Charlotte Webb uh, as I was studying and reading this week. This, uh, that book, that movie uh, kept coming to mind. And so for a definition, uh, we'll, we'll turn to Charlotte. And she says, humble, and I'll say humble and humble. Uh, I'll say it different ways. The reason I try to say humble is because apparently it freaks Tommy Lynn out for the H to be silent. But good Baptists say humble, right? Um, So humble has two meanings. It means not proud, and it means near the ground. That's Wilbur all over. He's not proud, and he's near the ground. And so I use this quote because um, our our account today uh, reminds me of of Charlotte's Web. And and so Charlotte wrote uh, several things, if you've read the book or, or seen the movie, uh, Charlotte writes several things in her spider web uh, to, to try to save Wilbur's life. And, and she begins by uh, writing some words that are kind of instilled with confidence or, or pride. And so she writes, uh, some pig. And you got to be from Wilkes County to say that right. Some pig. Uh, and then she writes, um, terrific, and then radiant, and then finally, humble. And so in the end... Humility is is what saves Wilbur's life uh, in that story. And, and so being humble rather than proud. And the same can be said about Nebuchadnezzar as we find this morning. And so kids, see if you can answer uh, these questions as we study this morning. Uh, the first one is, is what is Nebuchadnezzar sharing with us? Nebuchadnezzar is going to, uh, to share some words with us this morning. Uh, then the second question is, is what did God make Nebuchadnezzar act like? And then finally, what was God teaching uh, Nebuchadnezzar? Because there's going to be some kind of strange things uh, that happened to Nebuchadnezzar. And so listen for the answers to those questions. And so uh, we'll pick up Daniel chapter 4, verse 1. Uh, it reads, King Nebuchadnezzar to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. Peace be multiplied to you. It, it has seemed good to me to show you the signs and wonders that the Most High God has done for me. How great are His signs, how mighty His wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and His dominion endures from generation to generation. And so when we began our, our study uh, and looking at Daniel, we said that, that Daniel... Um, wrote this book, and we actually talked about this a little bit on Wednesday in our our Bible study, and how that kind of happened, or how we think that happened, and so um, we we think that Daniel wrote down some of the the things that happened in his life, almost like keeping um, memoirs or or writing a diary, Um, and then later somebody um, edited those and, and put those together in this uh, final canonical 
form. Um, but here, who is doing the writing? Because it's not Daniel. It's Nebuchadnezzar. It's the king uh, that's telling us his story. And so what we're reading is uh, Nebuchadnezzar is sharing his testimony. Um, he is, uh, I, I believe this is Nebuchadnezzar's conversion story. And, and we often don't associate conversion with with. People in the Old Testament, a lot of times we think about conversion, um, we, we think about the New Testament and what happens after uh, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Um, but this was before Jesus' time, and so one of the questions you may have is, well, well how did people convert? Um, the answer to that is they converted to Judaism, but uh, more specifically, they converted to follow the, the one true God. So they turned from their gods uh, to worship the one true God of, of Israel. And so the Old Testament has uh, several um, conversion stories kind of scattered in its pages. And so uh, even if you think about how Israel began uh, as a nation, it's because God called Abraham. Abraham converted to worshiping uh, the different gods that existed in Ur, where, where God calls him out of Ur. Um, and, and that's kind of where the Chaldeans were, right? Um, and, and so God calls him to, to follow him, and he converts. He, he follows the one true God. Uh, we think about the stories of uh, Ruth, who was a, a Moabite uh, woman, or Rahab, um, as she helps the, the spies as they... Um, are spying out Canaan, and, and so she was a Canaanite, um, and she uh, converts, she follows God, she talks about how she has heard the stories of what God did in the Exodus as God led his people out of captivity. Um, think about in David's time, um, one of the, the most famous stories in David's life is when he uh, has this, commits adultery with Bathsheba, and he kills Uriah. Um, and we, we don't think about this often, but Uriah, it says Uriah the Hittite, right? And so he wasn't actually an Israelite. He was a Hittite that had come to, to worship the, the one true God. Um, what about the people in Nineveh? Uh, we read the story of, of Jonah and a lot of the people in Nineveh during Jonah's day. Uh, they repented and uh, turned to following God. And so this is Nebuchadnezzar's testimony about what God has done for him. And so it, it is his journey from uh, pride to humility. And he is praising God here for the signs and, and wonders that God has done. And uh, anytime you hear uh, the word signs and, and wonders, um, when we get to the Gospels, um, Jesus does signs to, to prove that he is God, uh, that he is the creator, that he has the authority to, to heal uh, that he has the authority to forgive sins. And so um, it's a demonstration uh, that he is God. And so Nebuchadnezzar is seeing this demonstration that the God of, of Daniel, the God of uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego um, is, is the one true God. And so God is going to humble uh, Nebuchadnezzar in a surprising way. And, and before Nebuchadnezzar kind of goes into his testimony and, and tells us how God does that. Um, he, he starts off here with, with a doxology, uh, with praising God. And, and so, uh, really, Nebuchadnezzar says, God has done, does this to me, um, to humble me, and I, I'm glad that he did that. In the end, I, I'm glad that God um, gave me this awakening, gave me this wake-up call. Uh, the realization that I needed in my life. And so he, he goes on to say that this is what all people, all nations and languages need to hear. Um, and so then he be begins his uh, account of what happens. He says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and prospering in my palace. I saw a dream that made me afraid. As I lay in bed, the fancies and the visions of my head alarmed me. So I made a decree that all the wise men of Babylon should be brought before me that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. And then the magicians, the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers came in. And I told them the dream, but they could not make known to me its interpretation. 
At last, Daniel came in before me, he who was named Belteshazzar, after the name of my gods, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And I told him the dream, saying, O Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you, and that no mystery is too difficult for you, tell me the visions of my dream that I saw and their interpretation. And so... Here is Nebuchadnezzar's second kind of troubling or or frightening dream. And so he says, I I was in my my house. I was in my palace. I was comfortable. I was at ease. And and when I had this uh, dream, suddenly I I became terrified. And so he gathers all of the Babylonian wise men together again um, and says, tell me what this dream means. And this time he's going to tell them the dream that he has. He's not going to make them try to, to figure that out. Um, but just like the first time, uh, he tells them the dream and, and they can't tell him the interpretation. And, and so um, it, it's very likely. Uh, I think Nebuchadnezzar had a, a good inclination of, of what this dream meant. Um, he was just kind of in denial about what it meant because when he says, I was prospering, the word prospering, uh, in verse 4, it means to grow green, to flourish, um, to be in full leaf. And, and so it's a word that foreshadows the dream that he's about to, to reveal. Um, the, the fruit being full of, of fruit, being in full leaf. And there, this tree uh, in his dream is going to be described in that same way. And so finally, uh, Daniel comes in. And an interesting comment is, is made about Daniel. He says, I I know that uh, you have the spirit of the holy gods in you. So Nebuchadnezzar is admitting something. Uh, Two weeks ago when he called in the the wise men, the Babylonian enchanters, magicians, all of these people. And he says, tell me this dream that I've had and then tell me the interpretation. They say, well, nobody can do that. Um, what, What you've asked us to do, no king has ever asked. And, and what you've asked us to do, really only the gods can do, and, and they don't dwell with men. Um, and so here, God not only dwells with Daniel, um, the king says, Daniel, I know the Spirit of, of God is, is in you. The Spirit of God dwells in you. And so uh, last week we had the, the fourth man that, that looked like the son of the gods. Uh, this week, Daniel has the, the Spirit of God living in him. And so this is... Uh, we need to recognize that even in Daniel here, there is Trinitarian language uh, about God in three persons. And so uh, Nebuchadnezzar is more correct than he realizes. Um, And the people then, uh, the time that this was written, may not have had a full comprehension of of God in three persons, um, but they know something is different. Uh, Last week, Nebuchadnezzar knew something was different, that this person in the fire with him was not just a man, that he was some kind of of deity uh, figure. And and this week he's saying, you know, Daniel, you've got something living in you. You have something that my wise men don't have. And and so that's that's his admission. And so Daniel 4, 10 through 18, give the, the details of the dream. And so... Just to save time, I'll kind of summarize. There was um, this majestic tree. Uh, it was tall. It was strong. It was full of, of in full leaf. Um, it had fruit that sustained the animals. And so he, he says there were, were birds living in the branches. And it provided shade and, and fruit for the, the beast uh, in the field. And everything is good. And then all of a sudden... Uh, a watcher, he says a watcher, and that's his word for angel. Uh, an angel announces, come and, comes and announces, let this tree be cut down. Uh, let its branches be scattered. Let the fruit be scattered. Let the, the beast that took shade under its branches, let them flee uh, and, and, and cut it down to its stump. And then have uh, bands of iron and, and bronze put around the stump. And, and this is kind of a, a, a protection uh, that protects the part of the tree that is is left. And then the angel does something kind of strange. He refers to the stump as he. And he says, let, uh, this is an anthropomorphism. He says, let him be wet with dew. 
Let his portion be with the beast. Let his mind be changed. Let him be given the mind of a beast. And he will be this way for seven periods of, of time. And I'll go ahead and mention this. Um, it doesn't say seven years. Um, that's, that's what a lot of people uh, believe. But this could have been seven months. It could have been seven seasons, which would be uh, one and a half years. But it, it just gives us this kind of indefinite amount of time. But we, we know that in the Bible, when we talk about seven the number seven is um, the number of, of completion. And so God's saying, let, this, let him have this mind until what I want to accomplish is accomplished. And so that's the, the big picture. It, it's not really, um, we're not really focusing on how long this happened, but that God is accomplishing what he wants to accomplish uh, by giving him the mind of, of a beast. And so he goes on to say why this is happening, and it's to humble uh, Nebuchadnezzar. And so the, it says this sentence is by the decree of the watchers, the, the decision by the word of the holy ones to the end that the living may know, and this is repeated a few times in this chapter, that the living may know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will and sets, it, sets over it the lowliest of men. And so now Daniel is going to, to give the interpretation that the king has told Daniel the dream and this is Daniel's reply. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was dismayed for a while and his thoughts alarmed him. The king answered and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation alarm you. So he, he's saying, you know, be up front with me. Be honest. Uh, tell, me, tell me like it is. Uh, he sees the dismay in, in Daniel's face. His countenance changes. And Belteshazzar answered and said, My Lord... May the dream be for those who hate you and its interpretation for your enemies. The tree you saw which grew and became strong so that it reached the top so its top reached to heaven and it was visible to the end of the whole earth whose leaves were beautiful and its fruit abundant and which was food for all under which the beast of the field found shade and whose branches the birds of the heavens lived it is you O king who have grown and become strong your greatness has grown and reached to the heaven and your dominion to the ends of the earth. And because the king saw a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, Chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump of its roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze and the tender grass of the field, and let him be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be with the feast, beast of the field, till seven periods of time pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king. It is a, a decree of the Most High, which is... Come upon my lord the king, that you shall be driven from among men. Your dwelling shall be with the beast of the field. You shall be made to eat grass like an ox. And you shall be wet with the dew of heaven. And seven periods of time shall pass over you till you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. And as it was commanded to leave the stump of the roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be confirmed for you from the time that you know that heaven rules. Therefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. So before we move on, notice Daniel's reaction to what he knows. He, he knows that Nebuchadnezzar is going to be judged, that he's going to be punished or, or humbled. And Daniel doesn't do a dance. He doesn't say, yes, you're, you're going to get what's coming to you. you. You took us into exile, and so now you're going to reap what you sow. You're, you're getting what you deserve. That, that's not the attitude that Daniel has. Um, Daniel is concerned for King Nebuchadnezzar, uh, this man who is by all accounts his enemy. Um, he is dismayed. His thoughts alarm him. And so he says, may this be what happens to your enemies, king, not, not what happens to you. And Daniel is concerned for uh, Nebuchadnezzar's well-being and, and for Nebuchadnezzar's soul. Uh, he doesn't rejoice that his captor is about to be punished by God. 
he tells him, he, he warns him uh, that there might be a way that he could prevent or, or, or delay uh, this judgment of God on his life. Um, and so he tells him to, to break off your sins and, and your iniquities. And so, in other words, repent. Uh, and then he says, practice righteousness, show mercy. And, and so Daniel's advice to King Nebuchadnezzar is really repent and follow God. And so that, that's even in the Old Testament. Um, we see repentance and, and following, turning and, and following God. And, and so the, the same is true today. And we tell people to repent and believe the gospel, to repent and, and follow Jesus. And, then, and Daniel says, then perhaps God will, will show you mercy. So now this is um, kind of reminds me of, of the Beatitudes, kind of the Beatitudes in, in the Old Testament. And so we, we have here, uh, blessed are the merciful they shall receive mercy. Um, and so too often, our attitude when we deal with people, especially uh, people that have wronged us or, or rub us the wrong way, too often our attitude is, uh, I hope they get what they deserve. I hope they get paid back for what they've done to me. Uh, and my response to that is, is really? And you might say, well, yeah, because I, I want justice. I want them to, to pay for what they've done. They, they can't get away with what, what they've done. Well, what about you? What about me? Uh, what, what do we deserve? Um, well, I, I'm not that bad of a person. I, I'm really a, a decent person. I'm a good person. Well, have you ever lied? Have you ever stolen anything? Have you ever lusted after someone um, in your heart? Um, listen to uh, Wretched Radio and, and Todd Friel. And uh, that's often his evangelism tactic is to talk to people and um, kind of go through the, the Ten Commandments. And he'll say things like, well, have you ever told a lie? And they'll say, well, yeah. He says, well, doesn't that make you a liar? Yeah. Have you ever stolen something? Yeah. Doesn't, doesn't that make you a thief? And they're like, yeah, but it's just one thing. It doesn't matter. That, that's still who you are. That's, that's come out of you. Um, have you always given God the honor that He deserves? Have you always loved your, your neighbor as yourself? And, and if we really answer those questions honestly, guys, we're, we're not as good as we think we are. Um, we're, we're, we're bad people. And so that, that's, that's why the gospel is, is good news. That's why it's astounding. It, it, it's amazing when we grasp that on the cross, what we're seeing is both, at the same time, God's justice and God's mercy. Uh, we see God's mercy because we're, we're not getting what we deserve. We see God's justice because someone is paying the penalty for our sin, and, and it's Jesus. He, that's why we look to Him as, as Savior. He's done that on our behalf, on our account. And eventually here in, in Daniel, this, this dream, uh, it does come to fruition. Um, it, it, it takes about a year, uh, but it does come to fruition. So we continue. It says, All of this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of twelve months, he was walking on the roof of his royal palace of Babylon. And the king answered and said, Is not this great Babylon which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty. And while the words were still in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven. O king Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you, and you shall be driven from among men. And your dwelling shall be with the beast of the field, and you shall be made to, to eat grass like an ox. And seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Immediately, the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men and ate grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers, and his nails were like bird's claws. So here we see Nebuchadnezzar's sin, and, and it's really the, the very definition of pride. And so as Nebuchadnezzar is walking on his uh, rooftop terrace and he's looking at his palace, he's looking at his empire, the, the great city of Babylon with all of its uh, temples, with all the, the beauty and splendor that it has. 
He says, is, is this not my city that I built by my power for my glory? That's pride. I, I, I built this. I did this for my glory. So he says, I, I built this by my power. I am the origin. I am the source of everything that I see. I am the great architect, uh, the great wise one, the great military leader that is behind this. And so it, it's my ability it's my work, it's, it's my wealth that has accomplished this. And so Nebuchadnezzar sees himself as self-reliant, as self-determining, as self-sufficient. And then he adds that all of this work that I've done is, is for my glory. I've, I've done this to make a name for myself. I, I've done this so people around me will look at me, they will look at my success, they will look at everything that I've aspired to and they'll applaud they'll they'll look at me in in awe and wonder they'll praise me they'll they'll bow to me and pride says i I did it and i deserve it pride looks at all of the good things in life and says that that's by me i did that i'm smarter i I worked harder i wanted it more i'm the one who who did that I worked and I earned it. I I did that. But pride also looks at the bad things of life and says, I'm I'm owed more. We we often think of pride as just being for the elite, those who who have excess or they have abundant things and and say, well, they're they're prideful because of of all the stuff that they have. They they brag about it. But even if if life is not going good, that there's a form of, of pride that can well up inside of us And that form of pride is, why do they have all of that and I I don't? I I deserve that. Why why is life so unfair? I I deserve the promotion. I I deserve that job. I'm suffering more than them. I I don't deserve this. That's what I deserve. And so one type of pride leads to bragging. I did this. I I earned this. I achieved this. And the other type of uh, of pride leads to bitterness. I, I deserve what they have. And so pride causes us to act like beast. And, and that's really what God is illustrating here on a, a grand stage. That Nebuchadnezzar was already spiritually, he, he's already acting like a beast. And so now get, God gives him the mind of, of a beast. So that, that pride, that, that spiritual disease that he has manifests physically. So we think about how a, a beast acts. What, what does a, a beast follow? A, a beast follows its appetites. A, a beast acts on instinct, not by reason. And so if you, you ever drive in, in Wilkes County, we, we have uh, no shortage of, of cows and being able to, to watch them as we drive down the road. And, and cows just kind of wander aimlessly. Um, just trying to, to fill their belly. Um, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, he, he's not only eating grass, he's not only wandering around and, and people staring and saying, you know, he, he's acting like a beast, he's picking up handfuls of, of gla- grass, he may have crawled on all fours, I, I, I don't know. Um, but he starts to, to look like a beast. His hair uh, becomes long, his fingernails become uh, like bird's claws, and, and so he, he wanders for this period of... of Seven times, uh, months, season, seasons, years. Uh, his nails become thick and long. His hair is unkept. Um, and so now he's not only acting like a beast, he, he looks like one. And so when we have pride in our lives, we, we look and we act like beast. Uh, when we try to be more than, than what God intended us to be, uh, when we try to, to stand in the place of God, um, we actually become less than what God intended us to be. And, and that's the point here. When we, when we try to become more than what God created us for, we actually become less than what He created us for. Uh, we become beasts who are, are ruled by instinct, appetites, desires. Uh, we attack those who are, are weaker. We attack those who, who threaten our, our dominance or our, our domain. And so uh, the opposite uh, of pride is humility. 
The opposite of, of being prideful is being humble. And so humility, uh, where pride says, I, I did this, I, I deserve this, um, humility says, everything I have is, is a gift from God. Uh, everything I have is, is God's blessings in my life. I, I really don't deserve what He's given me. Uh, I, I really haven't earned this on my own. God is the one who ultimately gives me these good things, these blessings, these gifts I have in my life. If you think about it, if you honestly think about how little in, in your life you have control over, um, you didn't choose where you would be born, what, what time period you would be born. You, you didn't choose your parents. Um, you didn't choose the, the location that you were, were born. You, you didn't choose your skin color, um, your gender. You, you didn't choose your, uh, your abilities and your talents. If that was true, I could dunk a basketball. Um, but that's not true. We, we don't choose our abilities, our, our talents. Uh, we, we don't choose our intellectual potential. Uh, all of those things. Um, you, you may be in good health even. We, we think about our bodies and, and health. Uh, you, you can be in great health, but do you really have any control over keeping your heart beating? Um, over the breath that, that you, you take. Um, humility is, is realizing that we are totally dependent on, on God, uh, that we have much less control than what we think, that we're dependent on God for every breath, for every ability that we have, for uh, the health that we have. Everything is a, a gift from God. Now, now you might utilize those well, uh, you may take advantage of those gifts and, and excel and succeed and, and do things in your life, but ultimately, God is, is the one that gave you your abilities. He, he's the one that gives you um, what you're able to, to utilize. And, and this is what God is teaching uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Um, and, and so the refrain, uh, again, over and over in this chapter, we hear, uh, the Most High rules the kingdom of man. You, you weren't made to be God. You were made to glorify the God that created you. That's what the Bible teaches us. And, and when we fail to do that, when we fail to see that and live that out, then, then we live like beasts. Um, and so Nebuchadnezzar is humbled by God and, and has this awakening. It goes on and says, at the end of, of the days, at the end of that, that seven periods of time, it says, Nebuchadnezzar lifted my, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him who lives forever, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me for the, and for the glory of my kingdom. My majesty and my splendor returned to me. My counselors and my lords sought me, and I was established in my kingdom. And still more greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven. For all of his works are right, and his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble and so at the end of that time period, Nebuchadnezzar says, I, I lifted my eyes to heaven. My reason returned to me. Uh, in the end, uh, God teaches him a lesson, and Nebuchadnezzar receives understanding. And now Nebuchadnezzar, um, he, he sings another hymn, another doxology. Um, he says, I, I, I blessed the Most High there, there are no other gods besides him. I'm, I'm blessing the Most High. And his dominion and kingdom are everlasting. And all the inhabitants of the earth are regarded as, as nothing. So here is this king that had this great vast empire that, that says, Have I not built all of this? And now he says, I, I worship the Most High. And, and in his sight compared to him, I'm nothing. And all the inhabitants, inhabitants of the earth are as nothing in his sight. He does as he wills. And no one can challenge and question his 
authority. All of his works are right. All of his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he's able to humble. I want you to notice uh, Body Bauckham. Uh, I was listening to his sermon, and he brought this out, uh, brought this to my attention. But notice how Nebuchadnezzar's hymn and, and Jesus' model prayer are so similar. And so Nebuchadnezzar says, I, I lifted my eyes to heaven and blessed the, the Most High. And he says later, I, I blessed the King of Heaven. In Jesus' model prayer, he says, pray as we pray to God. We, we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And then Nebuchadnezzar goes on and says, His kingdom endures from, from generation to, to generation. His kingdom is everlasting. In Jesus' model prayer, he says, Thy kingdom come. And then Nebuchadnezzar goes on and says, He does according to His will in heaven and on earth. And Jesus says, As we pray to God, we should pray. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so this is someone who recognizes their, their dependency on God. This is someone who, who says for uh, bodily health, for, for daily life, in work, in pleasure, in everything that I do, everything that I have is a gift from God, His kindness, His grace in my life. And so Nebuchadnezzar converts here. He entrusts himself to God's mercy, to God's grace. And, and that's why God enters the picture here. And, and that's why Jesus came. So that we could entrust ourselves to God's mercy and grace. Jesus came to convert us from, from God-like dependence on, on ourself to childlike dependence on Him. And that's why He says in, in Matthew 18, 3, He says, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus is telling us that the way to God, the way to, to have that relationship with God is to look at God like a loving father that, that, that helps a child that uh, children are, are dependent on. And uh, I, I think right now of, of Melody, um, my granddaughter, and she's got this thing. Um, a lot of times uh, through the week I'll, I'll help watch her kind of babysit, and uh, I don't mind it. And, and she's got this thing. We'll, we'll kind of walk out in the yard, and um, we, we've got different steps and, and things at the house to where when she gets to those things, uh, she knows I'm following her. Um, and so she'll get to something and, and she she can't make the step. She, she can't make the step down. She can't, you know, make the step up. She's, she's going to fall. And so when she gets to those obstacles, when she gets to those things that, that she can't do by herself, she'll hold her hand up and, and she, she says, hand. And, and so she just waits for me to grab her hand to, to help her. Guys, we, we can't bridge that gap. Our, our sin has made a gap between us and God. And the only way that gap can be bridged is if we take our hand up and say, God, I, I depend on you. It's all you. I, I can't make that step on my own. I, I can't work and, and use all of my effort. I can't be good enough. I, I, I can't. I can't. So God, will you give me your hand? Will, will you be the one that, that rescues me? Will you be the one that, that intervenes, that, that makes this possible for me to, to know you, to love you, to, to walk daily in, in life? And, and there are so many things in our life where there's problems and there's things that when we see it and, and we're at a loss, how, how am I going to get through this? How am I going to walk through this? And it's that same childlike dependency where we just raise our hand up to God and say, Daddy, can I have your hand? Will, will, will you help me through this? Will you, will you be there? And he is. She, she doesn't question, is he there? Is my grandpa going to, going to help me? Is, is he going to, to be there? She, she knows I'm there. God's the same way, guys. It's just so often that we're stubborn and we're, we say, well, I can, I can do it. I can, I can make the step. And, and we even fall sometimes because we're stubborn. Because we, we want to be independent. We, we want to say, well, I can do this. And God's saying, you, you, you knucklehead, I'm, I'm here. That's why I'm here and, and I love you. 
And, and that, that's why Jesus says, come, come to me, who are, you who are uh, weak and heavy laden, and, and I'll give you rest, right? And, and so it's that childlike dependency on, on God. Um, it's recognizing that everything that we have is a gift, and, and that changes us. If we truly, truly grasp that and live that way, it will change us. It will change our interactions with people. It will change our willingness to serve others instead of wanting to be served. It will change how we use our resources, our time, our treasure. It will change us, guys, if we can really latch on to that, that we are totally dependent on God and His grace. And so um, I'll end this way. Um, we often try to communicate salvation in, in, in different ways. And uh, one, one of those is you'll hear people say, well, you, you need to make Jesus Lord. You need to make Jesus King. And, and here's the reality, folks. He is King. You, you don't have to make Him King. He is King. And you will either rebel against that Reject that and try to, to do things your, your own way and try to make your own way in life or you'll confess that He is King, that He is Lord, and, and you'll, you'll follow Him. Guys, He is the Creator. He is the Source. He, he is the King. So let, let's live our lives that way because we, we owe Him everything. We owe Him everything. Father, we thank You for your word and, and how it challenges us and, and teaches us. And uh, God, I, I pray that it works in our lives. God, that as we come to church and as we go to Sunday school and, and Bible study and even in our own personal devotional times, um, if we're just trying to, to memorize stories and facts and knowledge, we're, we're missing it. God, we, we need to meditate on your word and, and realize that you're teaching us truths and uh, allow your spirit to work in us to, to change us, to be more like Jesus. And God, we thank you for your patience with us in that because we are stubborn and we're off to, to wonder. But God, you're faithful. And uh, so we just thank you for that. And I, I pray that you would be with uh, the people that um, aren't here because of sickness, that you'll continue to, to be with them, give them healing, uh, be with their families as they support them, be with those that are traveling this week, um, who are home vacations. God, just uh, protect them and uh, bring them back to us safely. And God, again, we just thank you for our church family. And uh, most of all, thank you for Jesus and uh, his love and compassion for us, his death on the cross and in our place. God, we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys have a good week.